Hey folks, so for this episode we're going to go over the basics of magic in heathenry. Now, there have been entire tomes for academics and heathens alike that cover this subject. I cannot hope to do the whole breadth of what can constitute magic and heathenry, even in the amount of time that I could put into this video alone. So, I'm not going to. What I'm going to go over is the basics of what magic is and what it does, at least from my perspective as a polytheist and as a heathen specifically. So what is magic? Magic is boiled down the ability to weave or carve earther, or as it's known in uh, Anglo-Saxon, weird. So earther is the fabric of reality. It's how things fit together, it's how your lives are interwoven with other people's lives, like that of the gods, that of the ancestors, that of the Vaithir. So it's not just a human space. It is everything from the beard on my face to the tiniest grains of sand on the beach over in Lake Michigan to the air I'm breathing. Everything is tied together or carved together, if you will, depending on how you see it, in Earther. And Earther is the name of one of the three Nornir, the great Nornir, that basically governs the unfolding of reality, or the weaving or the carving of reality. So why do we use uh, carving and weaving metaphors? Because in the poems and the sagas that we have, that is very much what's referenced, that uh, it is often said that fate or Earther, depending on, on your translation of what the author is translating earther or weird into. Uh, it either takes on the connotations of spinning and weaving or it takes on connotations of carving. And it just depends on what part of the sagas you're looking at. So, uh, with regards to magic, uh, like I said, boiled down, magic is the act of carving or weaving earther in a way that you want to see happen. And with that broad of a approach, it can be said for mundane actions to be a form of magic. Well, obviously that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about spiritual effects on how events unfold. And the sagas do talk about this. Uh, for instance, Konungur, that is kings or Gothi uh, chieftains, being able to project their power, their megan, uh, over a person or a group of people and uh, so there's different ways of magic having expression in some ways that were more acceptable in the periods that these things were written down than others. Uh, a classic example is the accusation of Ergi and like magic Ergi is too damn complicated to get into for this short amount of video but suffice to say it was an insult that you could be killed over and you could be outlawed if you wouldn't fight for it in terms of the insult. Uh, so that's, I believe, recounted in the Gragas, or the Great Goose Laws. And what Ergi is, is it's an accusation or an imposition that you are the bottom, using modern-day nomenclature, in a homosexual relationship. Now what's interesting is it's noted that it's the Ergi, the person who's on the bottom, who has, really has the shame, not the person penetrating which has interesting connotations when you take it from the realm of just homosexual acts into magic, which is what Seth Brender or Seth Mother were often accused of, if not all the time accused of, or it was just assumed that's what you were, um, if you copped it to being a Seth Mother. Uh, Seth Mother is a Seth man or a, mar or a person, a man who per performs Seth, and Seth is a form of magic. Again, I am not going to get into the nitty-gritty details. Suffice to say, say this often interpreted as magic or witchcraft, and say this is also connected with the invitation of spirits. One of the most famous examples would probably be the Eric Saga Rauther, or the Saga of Eric the Red, which is uh, it takes place in Iceland, and part of it recounts how a vulva, a uh, wand carrier or a staff carrier, uh, comes to the little village uh, in the story and 
prophesize after one of the local girls is convinced to sing what's called a varthaloker, or a warding, or a spirit-enticing song. Um, the act of Seder often involves uh, psychosexual elements, such as either direct references to things like literally writing, like kveldritha, cold writer, uh, or to uh, munritha, mouth writer. And there are sexual connotations to this as well as spiritual ones. Um, so there, the, the way that Seder is understood is very broad and it's applied to a lot of things, both in terms of academia and in terms of modern heathenry that may or may not fit. But suffice to say, again, Seder encompasses a couple of big forms of magic. And as does Spa or Spe. I've heard it pronounced both ways. Uh, and that is... Uh, prophesying basically that is prophesying uh, you also have uh, some folks look at divination as magic I kind of hype it off into its own thing because it's easier to classify that way as to a difference between divination and magic uh, divination can involve magic but not necessarily and it's much more about finding information or getting information to come to you than it is about actually affecting the world there's other forms of magic which are much more uh, readily seen. So taking it out of the more psychosexual elements of Sather and into something that everybody would be able to recognize would be something like a Taufer. These are Taufer. Uh, anything that is carved into, say, wood, metal, uh, is supposed to be a protection or a talisman or an amulet uh, would probably be uh, classified as a Taufer. Then you have Leoth, which is a form of chanting. You have um, also uh, various other terms, which I, I could keep going on all the different terms we have for this. Uh, Galder is a very famous one, which is another form of magic, of course. Uh, and modern heathens, such as myself, uh, look at it as uh, a way to work with the runes, but it also it can be just song spell. So Galder is um, often uh, translated as to croak or to crow or to uh, sing. Um, some folks relate it to the etymology of gala, to croak like a raven. Uh, others relate it to the uh, particular measures that were taken in terms of poetic, uh, the Galdralag. Uh, so there's different camps of thought on even the most minute forms of how magic might have been performed and this is something that is not settled in heathenry and I'm not looking to settle it but it's good to know that there's a couple of different opinions out there even though I, I happen to have one of them and so magic in modern polytheism and modern heathenry is intertwined in ways that I have heard asserted by academics and some heathens probably would not have been to our ancestors, but I find that awfully hard to believe given the amount of small rune carvings that are found on relatively small objects. Um, not just used for communication, but are clearly magical talismans. Uh, Tersh Sperklin's book on uh, runic inscriptions is an excellent resource if you're looking for that. I'll put that link in the show notes and I will uh, be sure to include a link to that book on uh, at least Amazon. Uh, I know it's the great evil, but I also know it's very accessible for folks through that route. Um, so magic, if it's if it's the spiritual affecting of Earth or and how reality unfolds, what does that look like? It can take a lot of different forms. One of the more popular and uh, old ones as far as modern paganism go uh, would be candle magic. Now this has a, a bunch of variations on it and again I can't get into it. Uh, suffice to say, candle magic has been wrong for as long as we've had candles and as long as we've had ways to manipulate light. Um, there's carving objects with runes, with phrases. Uh, this takes place in both a heathen and a Christian context. For instance, the Christian context of the Sator Square, uh, the heathen context of various runic inscriptions, the inclusion of animal motifs, in uh, carvings on helmets and things like that, uh, paintings and so on and so forth, could be seen as 
not only being decorative, which it clearly was and very beautiful in a lot of cases, but it also can point to an invocation of that animal element as well, or the uh, elements of, say, different gods, goddesses, and their associated animals. Uh, the understanding, of course, that we can't say anything 100% for sure, but archaeology gives us some interesting tidbits and clues. Uh, the work that was done by Dr. Neil Price in The Way of the Viking, or I'm sorry, The Viking Way, is very excellent, and it's one of my go-to sources as far as having a storehouse of information and references. Um, the book itself is wonderfully written. It's in its, I believe, second edition, and that was just recently revised. It's excellent. I recommend very heartily that anybody who can afford to get it, get it. Because if nothing else, the if nothing else, the bibliography section itself opens up an entire galaxy of content that you can access. So, moving away from the academic, because I'll, it's not my field of expertise, but like a lot of heathens, I have to dip my hands and my toes <laughs> into a lot of different ponds in order to better revive and reconstruct. So, how what does magic look like in practice? So beyond candles, beyond carving. Uh, magic, in my understanding, is the application of your will on Earther. Uh, your desire to see change and to do things that will affect that change. So magic in and of itself is not going to land you a job, for instance. You need to fill out the application. <laughs> you need to give all the avenues uh, at least a try in order to get the job. But once you have put forward the effort of going to the job and filling out the application, or a lot of us fill them out online now, once you do all the requisite steps, you work with magic in order to get those scales to tip in your favor. And sometimes it can be a dramatic chipping, like putting an entire foot on the proverbial scales, and sometimes it's just a light tap. And some of that comes down to the expertise of the person doing the work. Some of that comes down to who you're asking, who you're allying with, who you haven't allied with, who might be doing magic for their own benefit. Because we're not the only ones slinging magic. We're not the only ones praying to gods and asking for help with a job. So the unfolding of Earther is a collaborative project, even if we have certain parts of the carving that are going against each other, <laughs> that aren't trying to mesh. Uh, so the magic is a push and a pull kind of in the sense of carving, you know, when you're, you're, uh, carving a piece and you're trying not to fight with the wood, you're trying to carve lines into the wood without shredding your fingers or ruining the piece. Uh, magic provides you a way of finding the grooves to make your cuts better, to maybe take more time to sharpen and then when you actually work on the piece you're more focused you're calmer and you're more invested in the process so you're much more thorough and some folks can chalk this up to well this is placebo effect and sure you could do that but for heathens and polytheists magic and its effects are very real and i really hasten to emphasize that because just chalking magic up to a bunch of kids playing in their imagination is a problem because once we start denying the effects of magic and once we stop uh, respecting the experience and practice of those within our own religions, we run a very real risk of kind of denigrating a lot of stuff in the process in no small part because our gods practice magic and that's who we get the magic from in the first place. Uh, the Saith Kona of Saith Konas, the Saith Woman of Saith Womans, the one who brought Saith and most of the forms of magic that the Aesir know, was Freya, the Vanir goddess. And she is known as the Vanadis, and she is like the penultimate witch and magician. Like, folks, I, I cannot emphasize this enough. So many people like emphasize her beauty and sex and lust. But folks, she is wreathed in power. 
And by denying magic, we deny a very living, powerful, real part of our gods. Um, and it's not even in the sense of, like, I can throw lightning from my hand, but the interconnectedness of Earther and their ability to weave and work and handle it, in part, relies on how they deploy their power. Now, if you think of magic as power, as the influence over a sphere of influence that you might have or may not have, uh, you know, there's degrees of separation between you and people who can get things done, right? So the magical effects we might be looking for may not be as dramatic as something as, say, D&D, &D, where we can throw lightning down a hallway or blow up a room with a fireball, but we still can produce pretty amazing effects and change. Magic can be used to change internal and external landscapes. Uh, we have several indications in the sources of magic being used to affect courage in battle, the hardiness of swords and soldiers, the ability of a given magic user to affect weather, uh, the minds of the enemy, uh, even across great distances to shape shift and so on and so forth. Um, people might look at these and say, well, aren't these just fantastical? Well, sure. Sure. But for those of us who engage with magic and engage in it, it's not just a fantasy. It is a lived relationship with reality where you are putting out into the universe a very real working that pulls and tugs on all the other strands of reality that you're attached to and tugs, pulls, carves in such a way that your will is done versus that of others. And you can see some pretty dramatic results and what matters at the end of the day with regards to magic and polytheism is, is it enhancing and is it something that is a wonderful addition to your spiritual practice. Um, unlike uh, what often folks think of when they think of magic, like it's just going to take your life over, it needn't do that either. Um, you can do a spell for attracting a job and then not worry about picking up magic ever again. Okay, it worked once and I don't need to pick it up again. Maybe you find a spell that works to attracting good business, say you're a small business owner. Well, anything that tips the scales, right? And then maybe, well, that worked. And you'll investigate further and see, well, does this keep working? Uh, the, the understanding here is, of course, that you don't have to get into wish fulfillment to have effective magic or to view it as viable alongside other spiritual phenomena. And there's not a lot of use in denying its existence, given how intertwined it is with our gods and our stories. And I'm not just talking heathen gods here either. Um, the power of names comes up in Kemetic myth uh, quite frequently, uh, but especially in terms of, say, the cases of Aset and Re, or Isis and Ra. The power that Isis wields in part was given to her when she tricked Ra into giving him her, I mean, giving her his name. So, you know, it's not just one, one heathen's like view of, well, we shouldn't dispose of magic because, you know, it's really important to heathenry. It's really important to polytheism in general. And I think we allow the denigration of magic as this backwater, backwoods, stupid thing to the detriment of the whole movement. So magic, it's, it takes a variety of forms. There's a lot of techniques and training that goes into doing it effectively, discipline and work. But if you put the time and the effort in, I think anybody can learn to do it well and effectively. And so if that is something that you want to learn more about, hit me up on my Patreon and maybe we'll see about producing more videos on the subject. But as it stands, I'm at about 19 minutes and counting, almost 20. So I'm going to drop it here, and I will see you all in the next one. Thank you for listening. Bye.